Nathaniel West, in his novel, A Cool Million, published in 1934, deliciously satirizes optimism through his main character, Lemuel Pitkin, who remains cheerful in spite of numerous misfortunes and ultimately an untimely death. In fact, the novel's subtitle, The Dismantling of Lemuel Pitkin, adequately describes our hero. For one definition of dismantle is to take to pieces. And as Shag Polk Whipple, leader of the National Revolutionary Party, says at the end of the novel, alas, the mule Pitkin was dismantled by the enemy. His teeth were pulled out, his eye was gouged from his head, his thumb was removed, his scalp was torn away, his leg was cut off, and finally he was shot through the heart. No, this is not a gruesome downer novel. Its language is a verbal feast, and because the title of this symposium is Language and Thought and Action, after reading it, I knew it would be an excellent choice. Next, a word about the title. The novel is prefaced by what West terms an old saying. John D. Rockefeller would give a cool million to have a stomach like yours. Yeah, whatever that means. Oh well, a better explanation comes from an early scene when Lim meets on a train a young man who tells him, I'm afraid I'm rather an idler. My father left me a cool million so I don't feel the need of working. Of course, poor Lim doesn't realize the speaker is a con man and believes him. A discussion of a cool million with an emphasis on language would suffer, I feel, if some of the characters' names were not addressed. Lemuel Pitkin reminded me immediately of literature's most famous Lemuel, Lemuel Gulliver, whose last name suggests gullible, and poor Lem Pitkin is unbelievably gullible. Other characters have down-home, rural, country, sometimes biblical names. A sampling follows. Hiram Glazer, Ezekiel Purdy, and Elmer Haney. The name Shagpoke certainly is humorous, especially when linked with Whipple. And a personal favorite is Israel Satinpenny. No, he's not Jewish. Rather, he's an Indian chief. When I saw this name, two thoughts came to mind. One, the myth that American Indians had something to do with the lost tribes of Israel, and two, the old Indian penny. But who knows what West had in mind, if anything. A Cool Million once again focuses on Lam Pitkin, who at 17 leaves his home in Vermont to seek his fortune right here in New York City. Alas, the family home is about to be foreclosed. And this sounds like an incident straight out of old-fashioned melodrama, and Lam must earn $1,500. But poor, naive Lam constantly confuses facts with inferences a miscommunication pattern William V. Haney calls the inference observation confusion. Lim finds himself in pickle after pickle. It is also important to note that a cool million can be interpreted as a satire on the American dream and on Horatio Alger novels. Lim, like Alger heroes, tries to do the right thing and work hard. But unlike Alger heroes, he certainly has not achieved monetary success or the promise of a great future by the end of the novel. After all, the struggling lad is killed. For example, early in the novel, Lem rescues Betty Prale, the novel's heroine, and a girl with whom he was in love in a boyish way. He uh, rescues Betty from the town bully. When Tom Baxter, the bully, wants to shake hands with Lem, our hero thinks Tom is being a good guy. Lem, after all, quote, was a fair-dealing lad himself, 
and he thought that everyone was the same. So in thinking all people are fair dealing, Lim certainly makes a hasty generalization and perhaps demonstrates an ominous attitude. Lim's troubles, though, really begin on his train ride in New York City. He meets a stylishly dressed young man who tells him that his name is Wellington Mape. His uncle is New York City's mayor, and his father left him a cool million. Once again, West may be having fun with names because the old English meaning of Wellington is from the wealthy estate. MAPE is a statistical term that perhaps just sounds good with Wellington. Lim makes the inference observation confusion when he concludes, quote, his new acquaintance must be rich because of his clothing and his extreme politeness, quote, not realizing, of course, MAPE is a con artist. He even tells MAPE where he's hidden his money, a little less than $30, Shag Polk lent him. Later, when Lim wants to buy an orange, he discovers his money is missing and learns from Steve, the newsboy on the train, that Wellington's the culprit. From that point, Lim's problems worsen. He places his hand inside his pocket where he had kept his money and withdraws a diamond ring, which he says he saw Wellington wearing a fellow passenger who has been eavesdropping on the conversation between Lim and Steve, tells Lim he is a pawnbroker who can estimate the ring's value. Of course, Lim, again making the inference observation confusion, assumes the man is telling him the truth, especially when he says the ring is worth $50, far from its true value of more than 1000 Furthermore, he'll give Lim $28.60, that is $28.60 for it, which Lim readily accepts. The so-called pawnbroker, who in reality is Hiram Glazer, an underworld character known as the Pinhead, leaves the train and poor Lim to his fate. Lim is arrested for stealing and selling a diamond ring. At this point, West has a great time stereotyping various ethnic groups. It must be remembered, though, that the novel is a satire, and I truly believe he is using these stereotypes for comic effect. He by no means wants the reader to take him seriously, at least I hope not. So when Lamb is taken to jail, he meets Sergeant Clancy, an Irish policeman whose first word is Begora. Other Irish cops use expressions such as faith now, me lad the jig is up, and me lad it won't wash. Poor Lamb is then sent to prison where he loses his teeth. For as prison warden Ezekiel Purdy says, teeth are often a source of infection and it pays to be on the safe side. Meanwhile, Betty Prail who faints following the incident with the town bully, is captured by Italians. Isn't a common stereotype that these people are A1 criminals who take her to a house of ill repute in New York City where she is sold to Wu Fong, the proprietor, for $600. Wu Fong, when introduced to the reader, is, quote, an ancient Chinaman who was doing sums on an abacus. Nonetheless, he graduated from Yale University in Shanghai. His establishment to perpetuate the stereotype of the chosen occupation of Chinese living in America appears to be a laundry. But in reality, again, it is a brothel with a girl from every country in the known world except ours. USA, <laughs> thus explaining why Betty is a prized possession. It should be added later in the novel, Lim and an acquaintance, Sam Perkins, visit Chinatown, where Sam says to a Chinese man, no tiki, no washi, certainly perpetuating this stereotype. 
Of course, Jews do not escape being stereotyped. And at this point, let me say for those of you who don't know, I am Jewish. So I really found a lot of humor in West stereotypes, and I think it is important for a person to be able to laugh at himself or herself and not take himself or herself too seriously. Shag Polk, for example, who had been elected president of the U.S. and president of the Rat River National Bank, blames the bank's failure on Wall Street and the Jewish international bankers. No comment is, is necessary on the stereotypical association between Jews and money. And uh, when Lem is jailed again, following a rather unpleasant incident in Betty's house of ill repute, his lawyer is a small man mm -hmm, of the Jewish persuasion, whom West calls a member of the chosen people. The uh, lawyer's name, incidentally, is Seth Abramovitz, something like that. Okay, because of time constraints, let me summarize the rest of this. American Indians are stereotyped. Oh, my uh, satin penny is something of what I would call an anti-stereotype. He uh, doesn't use the uh, stereotypical Indian dialect we've seen again and again and again. And then uh, also, as I mentioned, this can be seen as the antithesis of uh, a uh, Horatio Alger novel. And there's a particular scene, two uncontrolled wagon horses running wild after a policeman scared one of them are about to trample an elderly gentleman and his daughter. Lem stops the horses, saves the two people's lives, but he is not rewarded. This does not lead to uh, any kind of uh, wonderful job that will make him a millionaire. And then um, I might say in passing, a coup million also has been compared to Voltaire's Candide, which has the subtitle Optimism. So. Uh, to move right along, oh goodness, uh, the uh, inference, observation, confusion, and indiscrimination, stereotyping from indiscrimination, seem to be the prevalent miscommunication patterns in this novel. We also find examples of allness and the either or fallacy, examples of allness, like all mothers, uh, Mrs. Pitkin, was certain that her child must succeed. You are merely sick, as are all criminals. The warden, prison warden says that. The depression has made all us Americans conscious of certain spiritual lacks, and I could go on and on and on. Shy Coke um, classifies capitalists as being either good or bad people as being haves or have-nots. Thus, A Coup Million, a relatively brief novel, but an overlooked gem, takes on an even richer meaning when analyzed using principles, definitions, etc., found in general semantics. Needless to say, not by a long shot has my analysis included everything that could be said, because after all, one can never say all there is to say about anything. Yeah.